Welcome to day 30. We made it. Uh, this is Matthew Struck with Treadstone Risk Management. This is day 30 of our 30-day insurance and risk management vlog. Um, this has been an awesome, awesome experience. And uh, I really, you know, thank you, you know, whether you came on board day one, uh, day 30, or uh, you're viewing this after the fact. I think this has been a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic trip and uh, I, I, I'm really happy that uh, I committed to do this. So what are we talking about on day 30? Day 30, we're talking about employee health and wellness plans. So employee health and wellness plans have been uh, around for a while. Uh, for a number of years, uh, employers have utilized these plans to try and achieve the overall goal of a healthier workforce. So uh, these things can be very powerful tools and helpful across an, a wide range of areas within your organization, uh, one of which is your health insurance uh, spend. And so, you know, a healthier workforce typically has less, uh, you know, health procedures and, and less chronic illness. Uh, it can also help you on your work's comp insurance. So uh, employees that do get injured on the job, if they have a higher level of health prior to the injury, Typically, they recover faster, they have less complications, and overall, it costs you less in terms of workers' comp insurance. And then the last piece of it is that uh, employee morale typically is higher in organizations where they have a really strong health and wellness plan with a lot of buy-in. Now, that being said, there's a couple of disclaimers that come with health and wellness program programs. The first of which is I haven't seen too many companies that do a really good job um, nor do I know of any that have an easy job of tracking the return on investment for health and wellness plans. You're going to have to dedicate capital. You're going to have to dedicate uh, hours, you know, personnel hours to setting up these programs and implementing them and tracking them. And then you're also going to have to dedicate employee hours for uh, those personnel that actually get involved in it because there are going to be certain things that you're going to you know, afford them the ability to do during work hours, and it's going to take them away from their, their normal daily duties. The other disclaimer is you know, that the whole aspect of really buying in, um, you have to have a, a dedication and a commitment to these plans to make, to make them work. And if you don't, you're never going to see the return on investment that you wanted, and the employees aren't really going to get nearly as much out of it. So we're going to talk through some practices that you can you can uh, use to, to best implement these types of programs and some attributes that you should include in there. Uh, the other thing I can tell you is if you can't fully dedicate uh, your resources to these types of plans, there are other areas that you could dedicate those resources to <clears throat> that might actually give you better bang for your buck, so to speak. But if you are really committed to uh, improving the overall health of your workforce and offering one of these plans, we're gonna give you some, some pointers on how to do that. So let's get at it. Okay, so before I really quick, quickly touched upon some of the, the benefits of uh, an effective health and wellness program, uh, I just wanna speak to a couple more of them in case uh, you, you didn't uh, understand how powerful these things could be. So uh, the first of which is less lost days of work due to illness and sickness. So a healthier workforce obviously misses less days of work and has less sick days uh, away from their, their daily duties. Uh, shorter recovery time for employees that are injured on the job. We talked about it before. Healthier employees typically have less complications. They typically bounce back a lot quicker. Uh, let lower health insurance costs. So 80% of health insurance dollars are actually spent on chronic illness. And uh, this is one of those areas where you kind of have to think about how you're going to spend your money. The uh, health and wellness plan, uh, when done correctly, can improve the overall health of the employee population and reduce the incidence of chronic illness, or at the very least, reduce the uh, effects of chronic illnesses and the symptoms. But uh, if you uh, are kind of on the fence and you don't necessarily know if you want to fully commit to one of these plans, there are a lot of other tools out there that you can include in your health benefits program or other aspects of your benefits program that can also target uh, the really high expenditures that are associated with you know chronically ill and and um, really uh, you know kind of high utilization employees for your health insurance. And uh, so, if you do have questions about those, 
I would definitely implore you to reach out to us, um, you know, comment or, or email us and find out because we do have resources along that line that are alternatives. And then uh, typically five to 10% of your overall employee base uh, contributes uh, or is responsible for 80 to 90% of the health insurance expenses uh, that are associated with your health insurance plan. So uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that with health plans and wellness plans, uh, if it's just the employees that are already healthy that are participating, you're not going to see a very good return on investment. So you have to do a really good job of reaching out to those employees that uh, you know contribute the, the most or, or responsible for the most of the, the health insurance spend. Um, be careful though because you can't necessarily single employees out based off of their you know protected HIPAA uh, health information. So always keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, better employee morale. Healthier employees typically have lower levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, and they, they typically have a, a, a better, you know, higher level of enjoyment with their job and just life in general. So that can have positive effects across the board. And then higher levels of productivity. So happier, healthier employees, uh, employees that um, have more of a sense of community. If, if there's a, a community component to your health and wellness plan, you know, they're going to be more productive and, and you're going to see the, the direct uh, economic, you know, positive performance results as a result of it. All right, some best practices. So the uh, first one is uh, something that's echoed throughout the 30 days of, of this uh, vlog series, and that is leadership from the top, okay? You never wanna fall into the trap of uh, leadership, uh, you know, saying that cliche line of, you know, do as I say, not as I do, right? You need the leadership front and center. They need to be showing that they're taking advantage of the plan and that they're involving themselves in these uh, these different attributes of the plan, these different programs that are included in it, and that is going to uh, hopefully inspire the rest of the workforce to really buy in. And you know, if you can show the results as the leader, uh, they're going to expect to see results uh, as the the rank and file or or as the personnel that are lower down on the org chart, um, and and they're going to buy in the same way that you're demonstrating that you're buying in. Um, Something to think about, and that this is a best practice, but it's not necessarily something that's uh, an uh, you know an obligatory um, move on your part. You should look to expand your current benefits to pay for a higher percentage of healthier behavior, procedures, activity. Um, I mean, if you can do 100%, fantastic. If that's uh, not feasible from an economic standpoint, at least look to try and reimburse costs associated with healthy behavior, okay? Things like regular checkups, uh, gym memberships, uh, you know, uh, various types of uh, healthy eating programs, uh, smoking cessation is a big one. If, you know, your employees want to take advantage of those things, try and make it so that they're not paying anything out of pocket for it. Um, or in some cases, you know, paying just a little bit uh, so that they have some skin in the game, so to speak but really try and build in uh, some kind of, you know, uh, uh, incentive within the program where you're paying a large majority of those expenses so that they feel like you're, you're really in it with them, right? You want to take care of them and you want them to be successful in getting healthier. All right, something else you can include alongside of just, you know, paying for some of these, these healthy behaviors and healthy habits, uh, incentivize, you know, the achievements that they might end up uh, um, you know, uh, being able to obtain through these plans. If, you know, they lose weight, if they, uh, you know, drop their blood pressure, if, if they have a certain level of activity, you know, if, if they can prove that they've gone to the gym a certain number of days or something like that, uh, include some, some benefits in there. Uh, you know, a lot of these programs, if you sign up for the program and do, you know, four or five things on a checklist, like get, get a, um, get an annual physical, get your blood screened, you know, uh, um, what have you. If you hit all the check marks, you might even be able to kick them back cash because uh, remember, it's it's in your best interest for them to do those things because if they're getting screened, if they're if they're finding out that they have an issue and working to correct it, 
in the long run, it's going to end up saving you a lot more than, you know, the 100 or $200 that you might throw back to them or the discount that they might get on their health insurance, uh, health insurance premium contribution. All right, track the group's baseline uh, uh, performance and then also the progress. So the organizations that really can do a good job of tracking the return on investment in these programs, you have to have a baseline. You have to know what you're starting from, and then you have to be able to track and measure uh, where you end up at or what your progress is like at certain certain time markers. So you know, make sure to use uh, any resources at your disposal to be able to do that. To, to create uh, or, or figure out the, the picture of what your employee base's health looks like at the starting line, and then uh, also be able to track what kind of progress and imp improvements that they've made through their involvement in, and activity in the plan and the, and the plan options. All right, communicate constantly about the achievements in the organization. A lot of these plans uh, you know, they're, they're, they have to do with momentum, okay? And getting employee buy-in, a, a lot of it is about being able to show them that not just the organization, but individuals within the organization are having, you know, really, really good performance and, and achieving some amazing things. And so you should really try and be a cheerleader and talk up those things and, and you know, uh, within reason, obviously, like I said, you, you can't necessarily interfere with uh, you know HIPAA laws and HIPAA information, but the uh, you know the achievements that are that are uh, reached by either groups or individuals really need to be communicated and and talked up uh, within the organization to to get other people inspired or to keep them inspired and involved in the plan. All right, always focus on the positive. You you don't in these plans you don't want to. Um, you know, include punishments for bad behavior. You don't want to disincentivize uh, people's involvement in the program by, you know, uh, picking at their failures if they tried to be involved and, and they didn't get to a certain level of achievement. Uh, you always want to focus on the good things that are happening because that that can snowball, right? Um, the the uh, idea of looking at the negative or, or focusing on the negative is never going to inspire more people. In fact, it's going to have the exact opposite effect. You're going to see less buy-in. You're going to see less of an ROI on the program. And as a result of it, you're not going to get the full benefits of you know that investment that you've made. All right, the last best practice that we're going to talk about is including families and loved ones of your employees in the program. Uh, a lot of them might already be covered under your health insurance program. So obviously, if you open these things up to, to those folks that are already covered under your plan, uh, you're going to have positive effects, positive effects if you can include them. Uh, you know, going back to the morale and the, the, the kind of good feeling aspect of, of having a plan and getting buy-in, you're also going to get more buy-in if families are doing this together, right? There's going to be some internal family... Uh, cohesiveness that contributes to them, you know, sticking to the plan and, and taking advantage, full advantage of the, the different options that are there. Uh, and it's also going to increase the overall um, feeling of camaraderie amongst everyone in the plan, uh, especially when the loved ones are involved in seeing results as well. Uh, and uh, as much as possible, uh, you know, in some cases it's not feasible, but in others it is, also include those family members and in those incentives from earlier, right? So if the family members are hitting certain um, certain uh, achievements, you know, make sure to incentivize them the same way that you would the employee. Uh, you might not necessarily be cutting them the check. You might be cutting the employee the check. But again, those, those small investments on the front end are going to pay huge dividends on the back end. So uh, that's it. We are done with our 30-day... 30 Days of Insurance and Risk Management blog. Um, on the specific article, there's some other resources uh, that you can uh, look into. Uh, so check out the blog. Um, go to treadstonerisk.com and pull down the, the About tab uh, at the top. And under News and Notes uh, is the, the full, full vlog, um, all of the different episodes in there. Uh, and what I'm going to tell you is, 
this is not the end. This is just the beginning of a lot of stuff that we're going to be putting out. Um, keep an eye out for it. Um, you know, we're not going to let it end here. There's so much more out there that we can bring to you. Again, it's always going to be a free resource. This is out there for anyone who needs it and can use it. And we really want you to uh, like, share, subscribe, comment, ask us questions. Uh, and just because the 30-day series is over doesn't mean that you can't double back and ask us questions or, or have a conversation about, you know, the information that's included in here. A uh, little shameless plug, we're also on other social media outlets, so please seek us out on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, connect to us, follow us, and the, we put out a lot of content there that might not necessarily be the same content that we're putting out on this vlog. Uh, so, you know, there's some other tidbits and things like that you can glean from following us in, on, on those channels as well. So I said it at the beginning, this has been an awesome journey, 30 days in the books. Uh, I'm happy that you were able to uh, take part in it, whether it's, you know, for the full 30 days or, or just for a couple of days here and there and, and, you know, sampling the topics that you really were interested in or you needed some information from. But uh, we're going to keep seeing you. And I want to thank you again for uh, taking, you know, taking the trip with us. So we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks.